We're going to start our exploration of fluid dynamics by first meeting the inviscid or Euler momentum equation. This is the equation that governs how velocity, vector velocity u, changes in time. And the ways that velocity changes are by either um, advection, by being carried by velocities in the system, um, or by forces. And the, the version of the inviscid Euler equation we're going to start with right now is really going to only have one force, um, the pressure gradient force. This is, in many ways, the simplest equation that you can have for a nonlinear fluid. Um, some of the terms are linear, some of the terms are nonlinear. We're going to learn a little bit about that. These equations here, um, so we've got, the, uh, we've got this bit. This is a, a derivative in time alone, a partial derivative with respect to time. We call this the Eulerian derivative with time. Um, this term here, this represents advection. This represents um, flow u being carried by flow u operating on gradients of that flow. So this is the advection term. This is stuff being carried along by a large scale flow. And then we've got this bit, which is the pressure gradient term. And these really capture a lot of the key interactions of how a simple fluid operates. Um, we call this an inviscid equation because it doesn't have any kind of Laplacian of u with a, with a diffusion coefficient out front. It doesn't have anything like this. That would be a viscosity, and we'll meet viscosities later in the course. For now, we're gonna consider just an ideal motion with no viscosity, no internal friction. Now, before we start playing with this equation and learning what some of the solutions are, I wanna ask you a few questions about just the equation itself. And the first question is, what is the order of this equation? What is the order? What is the order? Well, this, this is a, a first order equation. It's first order in space. And um, order is, um, order is a, in a sense, a counting of derivatives. What's the, the highest derivative you have operating in your system? And this system is first order in space because we have these gradients here. These are spatial derivatives. But we only have, in the inviscid equation, one gradient. We have one on pressure and we have one on velocity, but we don't have any double gradients or Laplacians or anything else. So we call a system like this first order in space. A system like this is also first order in time. Um, and the reason for that, again, comes from counting derivatives. So now we look at the, the time derivatives, the partial derivatives with respect to time, and we see that there's just one out front d by dt of u. Um, so this is first order in space and first order in time. Um, a, a system like this has a, a special name. We call them partial differential equations, or shorthanded as PDEs, partial differential equation. And a partial differential equation is just a differential equation that has both uh, a time dependence and a spatial dependence, really one that has a dependence on more than one of the, of the independent variables. Okay, so we have our, our first order PDE here, and I want to ask you the next question about this, which is how many variables are there? Um, and what are the variables of the system? How many variables are there? Variables. Hmm. Well, time's not one of the variables. Um, it's, it's part of the, the independent set. It's part of what sort of sets the system we're in. Uh, same with the spatial location. So the the variables here in the system, the dependent variables, these are u. Um, get my vector hat on there nicely. Um, these are the, the pressure, p, and the density, rho. Um, these are each a little different. So u, this is a vector, vector. And the vector u, right, this is, um, this is something that has a, a sense of spatial, um, it, it has values at different points in space and time, but it also points. It, uh, it points in a direction, and we can think of that as being made up as a combination of orthogonal vectors, um, an x part 
and a y part, say in a two-dimensional velocity like this, um, and and you point somewhere. And in a in a PDE, it really it points everywhere in um, both space and time, and it can point in different directions in different spots in space and time. Now p and rho are a little different. These are scalars. Um, scalars are just numbers. Uh, they don't they don't have a direction to them or anything like that. Um, we we think of tensor or we think of scalars in a tensor language as like a zero rank tensor. We think of a vector as like a a rank one tensor in a sense. And we'll we'll see a little bit about tensors as we go along. But we can just think of this as a, a vector. It points in different places at all spots in um, or it points in different directions at all spots in time and space. And p and rho are scalar variables. Okay, so. With our, with our three variables, right, which are one of which is a vector here and then, um, and then two scalars. So this is a five in 3D, 3D, where 3D means three dimensions. This would be five scalar variables. Um, and that's um, three from U because U is a vector with three components um, and then one from P and one from rho. All right, um, or we could think of it as three, one vector, two scalar. All right, my next question for you related to this is how many equations do we need to solve this system? How many equations? Well, we have three variables, and so in general, we're going to need three equations. Three equations. Um, we're going to need uh, one vector equation because we have a vector variable. One vector equation. Um, here that's the momentum equation. We need um, one scalar equation for the pressure P and we need one scalar equation equation for the scalar rho. So we need three equations, one vector and two scalar. If we think of them as like counting as scalar equations, which is a, a way we're often taught to solve simple differential equations, this vector equation in 3D would again be three different scalar coupled equations and then two additional five total scalar equations if we solve this in a component fashion. If we can solve it in a vector fashion, then we need one vector equation and two scalar equations. They're all coupled, um, meaning that you have to basically solve them all at once, um, unless you can simplify the system in some ways. And we'll, we'll learn some tricks to simplifying these sorts of systems as we solve them. Now, the last question I want to ask you about our equation here is about our terms in our equation. And the question I want to ask you is, are the terms linear or nonlinear? Are the terms in the momentum equation linear or nonlinear? Well, let's, let's write them out one by one, and then we'll answer that for each of these. So the first term in our equation was d by dt of u. And then we also have this um, u dot grad u. And then we have our pressure gradient term, grad p over rho. Well, let's, let's start with the first one, uh, d by dt of u. Uh, this is a linear term, um, and it's linear because the variables of our system u, um, u only appears once. And the derivative thing operating on it, that doesn't change the linearity of the system. It's linear in the variables of our system. Okay, so our next term here, um, u dot grad u, um, this is nonlinear. And the reason that it's nonlinear is that we have two occurrences of the velocity u. We have one u dot grad here, u contracting with the gradient operator. And we have two, it's then operating on the vector velocity again. So this is a nonlinear term which really just means it's not linear in the variables of our system. Um, we, we additionally sometimes note that this is a quadratic quadratic nonlinearity, and that's because we have a variable times another variable, so it's kind of like variable squared, right? It's like u squared in a sense. 
Um, and there, there's some nice properties to quadratic nonlinearities, as we'll learn, especially numerically. This is a quadratic nonlinearity. All right, so what about, what about this last term here, uh, grad p over rho? Well, whether or not this is linear or nonlinear uh, depends an awful lot on the character of rho. And I, I pick rho, the density, out because we're going to see that certain approximations uh, change how rho is treated, turning it either into a constant or a, a non-constant coefficient. So um, if rho is um, a constant, um, uh, or, or uh, 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 what's called an NCC, a, a non-constant coefficient. If it's just if it's a number or a shape, number uh, or shape that doesn't change with the flow or time or anything like that, then this is a linear term because all that would be um, in the system here is a gradient on p. And rho is just some shape function that modifies p, maybe even a number. If, however, uh, rho is a full variable of the system, so what this really means is rho changes in space and time with the flow itself, um, then nonlinear. And that's because uh, 1 over rho. 1 over rho is a nonlinear combination, a nonlinear operator on our variable. And then we've taken 1 over rho and multiplied it by the gradient of another variable, p. Um, and so this makes a, a nonlinear term. It, it actually makes a, a fairly complicated nonlinear term, especially in compressible fluid dynamics, as we'll learn later in the semester. Um, because this 1 over, when you take 1 over of a variable, that's actually in many ways a a wider bandwidth nonlinearity than a, than a quadratic nonlinearity. So there, there are particular um, numerical properties of a nonlinearity like 1 over rho that can make it challenging to solve and to understand the, the influence of. But we'll learn more about that in later discussions.